Um, thank you very much for inviting me here and for doing some homework um, about me. Thankfully, uh, so <laughs> that was okay. Uh, I think I'll just leave it there before I dig myself a hole. Um, yes, as introduced, my name is Luke. I am the executive director of One Body, One Faith. I came into post there at the end of May of this year. So it's still a relatively recent shift for me. Um, I trained for Baptist ministry, as mentioned, at Spurgeon's College, but due to my sexuality and the fact that I actually wanted to marry the man that I love, I'm not able to be ordained as a Baptist minister currently. Um, so that's an ongoing struggle that we're fighting. Uh, but I, am, I, I still feel called to ordained ministry and value all types of ministry as valid, but feel called to ordained ministry and what that represents. Um, and so uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm actually able to serve at Bloomsbury and and be part of the team there in, in conducting day-to-day -day life of the ministry team, but also being part of services, um, officiating over communion, all of those bits and bobs that actually, as a gay man, I've often been excluded from. Welcome hospitality and LGBTQ plus people seeking refuge and asylum. And before I kind of kick off properly, I just wanted to acknowledge the privilege that I hold standing here. Um, I am a white, able-bodied man, um, and so a cisgendered man. So speaking as someone who actually has no experience of needing to seek re refuge or asylum actually carries some clout. Um, and I'm aware that actually I'm probably speaking on behalf of people that actually have a voice themselves. And so I hope what I do today is signpost you to those voices um, and perhaps think about as we look around the room and think about the types of groups of people that we're, we're connected with, where are we hearing directly from those voices as well? I hope that I speak through a lens of intersectionality as much as I possibly can. Um, again, bearing in mind with the, the privilege that I have just by the nature of who I was born. Um, if you don't know that word intersectionality, I'm not gonna go into it too much today because it's a fascinating piece as, as already, but I would encourage you to Google it and particularly look up an essay online by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, she actually, um, sort of came up with that word initially to explore the uh, necessity of the liberation of black women in particular. Um, so I really would explore that concept if you have the time. And that's kind of the lens that I'll be going through today. One other thing on language, um, we, we hear the word diversity a lot. Um, and I think because of that, we've kind of, it's lost what it actually means. Um, I work a lot at how I manage a lot of my um, ministry is that I'm bivocational, so a lot of the work I do, I, I have a paid consultancy business that enables me to actually do the ministry that many are just, uh, released to by stipend. Um, and the work that I do in the corporate sector actually explore, a lot of that explores this idea of diversity, and everyone wants to be diverse now. Everyone wants to have the, the, the token person on their board that represents disability, or represents people of colour, or represents sexuality. Um, and if you talk to any one of those people who work in a corporate context, I can guarantee that they probably have been asked, oh, would you mind being on our diversity panel to discuss issues of diversity in the workplace? And then when challenged and they, they ask back, why have you asked me? It's like, oh, um, it's because you're ex, isn't it? And the presumption that just because you are diverse, whatever that means, you want to be part of a diversity panel. So I like to talk about representation which I feel is a far better word, and it's not a word that I came up with, I can't uh, claim credit for it, but I think it's a far better word when discussing what diversity actually means, which is people standing up and talking about themselves from their own experiences and genuinely be part of the structures that seek change, not tokenistic efforts to create a diverse-looking company or a diverse-looking church. I'm happy to talk about more about that later as well. And then thinking about inclusion and affirmation, and um, the Dean also mentioned welcome on there. I see this as a, a spectrum. So when I use, I probably will use those words today. When I use those words, welcome, I, I feel is the start of the journey. So if you're looking at it kind of in a, in a linear direction, you've got welcome here. Inclusion is kind of the next step where your theology might be inclusive. You might be able to do some, you might think, well, actually, yeah, Generally, as a whole, people are welcome and we hold an inclusive theology, but we don't particularly talk about it that much. And then affirming is actually we tick all the boxes. You can become a member. You can be an ordained minister in this community. You can raise your family. You can get married. That's an affirming church. I'm part of a church that seeks to be affirming. I've not yet, a met, a, yet met a church that 
can actually claim to be entirely affirming. Again, I'm willing to be challenged on that. But if you get to the underneath of it, and I'm talking about, again, talking about intersectional lens, if you get under, under the real nuts and bolts of it, who's in the leadership team? Who's being represented? Who's making decisions? Who's speaking for and on behalf of people? I have yet to encounter a church that is truly and completely affirming. So as mentioned, I'm the executive director of One Body, One Faith. In 2016, LGCM became One Body, One Faith. Um, uh, changing Attitude uh, closed, uh, Changing Attitude in England closed, and they uh, combined and became One Body, One Faith. So we've actually been around since 1976. We're the oldest um, LGBTQ plus members organisation in the UK. And I think we're probably highly ranking up there in the world as well, although I have no data to prove that yet. Um, and uh, we are an organisation that is built for our members. Um, I would hopefully... Actually, I'm not gonna, I don't think I've got time and I don't want to flick around too much with the um, video. But recently we've just produced a, a series um, looking at how churches can explore issues of inclusion and affirmation. Um, and this uh, video series is a dialogue between um, a young trans minister um, and a pansexual lay um, minister discussing what it's like to be LGBTQ plus in churches in dialogue revolving around the Amazing Love book um, and we've also produced a study guide that accompanies that. And this resource is designed to help churches who are probably more at this kind of in welcome, inclusive end of the spectrum have this conversation, but actually hear from LGBTQ plus people. One of my favourite phrases is no conversation about us without us. Um, often, well-meaning churches have lots of conversations about LGBTQ plus people with no LGBTQ plus people in the room. Um, and... The, the, the intent is, is valid and is notable and worthwhile, but actually hearing from the lived experience of LGBTQ plus people is essential when you're having conversations around um, affirmation and inclusion. So that series is now online and uh, readily available to our members, so I wouldn't be the executive director if I didn't plug membership. Uh, it's really simple to join, and I'd be happy to talk to you more a little bit about that later on, but it's also a bargain if I do say so myself. Uh, so that was going to be the video, but it's not working unfortunately. So, the global context. Every day we are bombarded with terrible news stories. On the way here, I read uh, four or five articles on The Guardian, um, or, or just on my app, um, and none of them were positive. There was no glimmer of hope in any of them. They were all doom and gloom, and I feel like that might be The Guardian's kind of way of talking about things anyway. Um, but none of them had any kind of glimmer of positivity. There was no like, oh, and here's a, good, here's a nice puppy or anything like that. Actually, it was just, you know, and I won't go into detail because some of it was actually quite uh, violent. But the global context at the moment is actually quite harrowing. And if you're an LGBTQ person, and then if you then layer on other elements of uh, marginalisation as well, it's an even harder place to exist. So across the Commonwealth largely those countries that were previously um, occupied by the British during the days of the established empire, homosexual activity remains a criminal offence in 35 of the 53 sovereign states. And it's commonly understood that this is a direct result of British intervention in those states. The anti-gay legislation, also known as the Sodomy Acts, comes from a 19th century Victorian understanding of morality and a particular lens of uh, understanding scripture. The penalties for private and consensual sexual activity between members of the same sex remains eye-wateringly harsh. And notice I'm only talking about L and G identities here. Um, it, the, the other letters not represented in these statistics, the marginalization is tenfold. So try and under follow that as I speak. The penalties for private and consensual sexual activity between members of the same sex remains eye-wateringly harsh in a high percentage of Commonwealth states, and their uniformity in punishment can be attributed to those sodomy acts, the Section 377 in the Penal Codes. In Jamaica and Kenya, it is punished by 10 and 14 years imprisonment, respectively, whilst it's 20 years plus flogging in Malaysia, Bangladesh, Guyana, Pakistan, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and Uganda, um, and the latter two have a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Um, in the 12 northern states of Nigeria, the maximum penalty for male homosexuality is death. 
So these are states that still acknowledge um, the British government, still acknowledge the Queen as head of state, still have, a, ha, still have a relationship with us that is bound in law. Um, as a British gay man, I'm repulsed by my inherited complicity in these current laws. As mentioned, Albania. Now, Albania is not a member of the Commonwealth. Um, Albania is not a member of the EU. It is a member of NATO. Um, it became a member of NATO in 2008. I have mixed feelings about Albania becoming a member of NATO. Happy to talk about that later as well. I first went to Albania in 2006, and I went as a typical church gap year, go forth and minister to the heathens, let them learn the love of God through you yelling at them about scripture. Um, and I went there for a week. Um, and I didn't want to go. I was 18, and I had absolutely no desire to go whatsoever. Um, I was not... I. <laughs> I don't think I was a particularly nice person. Um, highly materialistic, valued uh, things that really don't matter, um, and thought the idea of spending a week in what I considered to be a third world, and also not language that I would currently be happy using, but third world country, um, didn't float my boat. But I was forced to because it was part of this gap year. Um, so I did what I was told begrudgingly. And what happened was, is that I fell in love with the country. I fell in love with the people. I fell in love with the food. Uh, I fell in love with the climate. It's Mediterranean. Um, and the, the general sense of, actually, this is a country that is, that is relatively recently at that time breaking free of a really harsh dictatorship and is seeking uh, a future that looks great. I lived there for a, on and off over the next few years, uh, doing all the nice evangelical churchy jobs. I did some youth work, I did some kind of ministry with the people that were in the uh, Gypsy Roma communities, um, I worked with the poorest Albanians, and I did it all because I was a good Christian evangelical. And then I came out, um, and uh, I then realised that actually, although I love Albania, and I have a real passion for the people there, I was using it as an escape as a way of fleeing people. To, if I was a missionary, no one would ask me about my, why I was single. If I was a missionary, no one would make a big deal out of it because I could just go and hide. Um, and I did that in Albania very successfully. But I came out um, and it became very, quick, uh, became very clear very quickly that um, it also became very clear. Did you like a little slip of the tongue then? Uh, it became very clear very quickly that I uh, wouldn't be able to serve for a mission organization in Albania. Um, and that I had to reconsider what I thought God was asking me to do. But I actually ended up still working there. And as mentioned, I now work with um, the first uh, homelessness shelter for LGBTQ plus young people in the Balkans. It's based in the capital city in Tirana. Um, and what God did there was show me that actually my sexual identity and my passion and my, my call to mission are, are not mutually exclusive. But the reason I talk about it is because Albania is a, a deeply um, patriarchal and homophobic society. It's rooted, um, not as many people think, but it's, it's rooted in this uh, concept of masculinity that doesn't specifically come from Islam, but actually comes from a really toxic narrative of, of, of patriarchy and masculinity that we experience here in the UK as well. It's just been allowed to run rife um, in Albania. Um, it, is, it is nominally Muslim. Um, and when I came out to my best friend over there, I was terrified because he'd spent the, the first eight years of our friendship, seven, eight years of our friendship, telling me that gay people are awful, that they shouldn't be allowed in society, they're the reason that the world is going to explode and they should be stoned. Um, and he's a nice, genuinely, he's a nice guy. <laughs> um, and I love him dearly. Um, uh, but so I was like, oh, I have to come out because I keep taking my friend, my friend Steve to Albania and he's not dim. Um, so I came out and he hugged me and we both cried and he said, I don't understand, but I want to learn. Um, and for me, that was one of the most powerful experiences of, <laughs> ironically, from a non-Christian um, talking to me about acceptance and inclusion and what love actually looks like. I don't, I don't have those experiences in my church, um, which probably says something. But Albania um, remains homophobic. It remains um, deeply problematic for LGBTQ plus people, particularly trans people. There is absolutely no healthcare provision for people who are trans um, or non-binary. Non-binary is not a phrase that would be commonly understood in an Albanian context. Um, and the persecution is high. Uh, police uh, corruption leads to um, a high proportion of those who claim LGBT, uh, those people who are LGBTQ+, who claim assault because of their sexual identity or gender identity, actually themselves end up facing prosecution instead of those who attack them. And because of that, 
Albania being also an incredibly poor country, um, one of the poorest countries in Europe, 20,000 people applied for asylum out of Albania in 2018. Um, it's a country that has a population of 3 million. Um, so again, statistically a very high proportion um, that were seeking asylum. There aren't statistics specifically around how many of those were seeking asylum based on their sexuality or gender identity, and we'll come on to a, a reason why that might be later, but it's primarily because people don't want to talk about it because they're scared that it's going to be held against them and that it's going to be a problem um, when they're seeking asylum. So I have a lot of love for Albania. It's, it's a country that is conflicted and problematic, um, but it's also a country that is seeking change. And I think Straya, the, the shelter, if you want to look them up as well, um, is, a really, is a really good sign of the, what's happening on the ground in the Balkans and the hope that is out there for LGBTQ plus people. There's a documentary called, um, it's a bit blurry, it's called Ska and Dal, uh, or if you just type scandal with a K um, into YouTube, Albanian documentary. It documents the, the early days of the Albanian LGB primarily um, movement. Um, it's, it's a powerful um, hour and a bit. So if you've got time on your train journey, maybe later, I would really, it's on YouTube, I'd really recommend watching this. Um, it, uh, it, there are some problematic parts in it. So if you, you know, the, there's talk of abuse and, and, and that kind of thing. So just to be aware of that when you're watching it. But I want, there was a clip that I wanted to show you where a member of a prominent political party said that he would rather kill his son than his son be gay on live TV. Um, and that was in 2008. No, I'm lying, 2016, sorry. Um, so not that long ago. So if you have the time, do check out this because it, it is very much worthwhile. Moving on. So I mentioned the Commonwealth. Um, I wanted to give a couple of examples um, and just I don't know how much time I have based on the shifting of the time. So, so just like jump up and down or scream at me if I talk over because I will. Um, I wanted to pick on three examples that are linked to, they might not be Commonwealth states, but are linked to what the British Empire did. Um, because as uh, people who live in the United Kingdom, we have a responsibility to know about this stuff. So in India, things are looking up. Um, I don't want to go into the depths of the history of how many times this piece of legislation has gone backwards and forwards and how often it's been decriminalized and then recriminalized. But as it stands currently, homosexuality has been decriminalized in India um, after it was recriminalized, I think, in 2016, 2017. Um, so India. It shows promise. There's excitement, there's, there's movement on the ground. Indian culture, again, and I'm going to be speaking as someone who is not from that background, but Indian culture has often made way historically, according to the historian Sashi Tharoor, that there's been space for third genders, there's been space for exploration of different identities and different sexualities, yet British colonialism wiped all that away, hid it under the carpet, didn't want to talk about it. Um, and yet now we're seeing a resurgence in these communities being talked to and spoken about. Um, so the um, Dalit community in particular um, and the Harija, who are, um, who are trans women, um, they're exploring their identity in a, in a, in a modern-day India without that lens of colonialism. The, the historian that I just mentioned as well, um, Sashi Thoreau, said that um, it's about time, and this was before that the um, Indian government decriminalised homosexuality again, but it's about time that the Indian government got out of the bedroom, which the British government were unafraid of entering. Um, and I thought that resonated really powerfully for me as a gay man, because I don't know any of my heterosexual friends that have been asked about their sex life in the way that I've been asked about my sex life. That there's something that makes my sex life more accessible and there's a right to ask me questions about what the nature of my marriage is like that isn't there for heterosexual people. Um, and I think when we look at kind of case studies like India and the movement away from the, the, this British colonialism and this, this fear and loathing of LGBTQ plus identities, and we actually start connecting with communities that have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, we see actually that British colonialism, this actually quite small brick, in, in the history of the world has a lot to answer for. Uh, this picture is fabulous. That's why it's in the um, slideshow presentation. Uh, this is a, a um, pride demonstration um, and I just love it. That's why it's there. <laughs> Uganda. I did again have another video to show, but um, that was from a, a, a Ugandan pride march being disbanded. Um, so, um, and it was actually being quite violently disbanded a couple of year, years ago. 
that both male and female homosexual activity is illegal in Uganda. Um, and uh, again, it was widely, it is widely accepted that homosexuality, homosexuality was commonplace um, prior to the British Empire being present. Violent attacks against lesbian and gay people are, remain commonplace with little recourse for state protection or prosecution of those perpetrating the assaults. If an individual is found guilty of carnal knowledge against the order of nature, and we see some scriptural language being used there and also some Augustine um, language being used there, again, don't get me started, they can receive up to life imprisonment with a slightly vague additional sentence of up to seven years for gross indecency. Uh, there's now a, a, a strong link between anti-Western and anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric, suggesting that queerness is intrinsically linked to a Western liberal identity. Much Christian narrative in the country continues to link HIV and AIDS as a divine punishment on gay men, which seems to ignore that statistically women and young women, um, especially, and therefore their children, are disproportionately affected in Uganda. Consequently, the number of LGBTQ plus asylum seekers from African nations such as Uganda is high, with countries like the UK not doing nearly enough to support the asylum seekers, seeking proof of being LGBTQ plus and asking invasive and demeaning questions of a sexual and intimate nature. Again, this video is on YouTube, so you can just, if you search U Ugandan pride, um, I, it will come up. Brunei is the uh, country that has the most worrisome state of rights for LGBT people in Southeast Asia, according to Outright International. Recent changes in the law have grabbed the attention of the global press and have caused outrage. Prior to the current law, homosexuality was illegal and punishable by up to 10 years imprisonment, regardless of whether the act was done in private and consensual. In 2014, Brunei announced it would begin imposing Sharia law, it was scheduled to be enacted on the 3rd of April 2019, but since then, and seemingly due to international pressure, the Sultan of Brunei has indicated that the death penalty will not be enforced. But I can imagine that's little comfort to those people who are actually on the ground in a country where this law is current. You may have also noticed that there are a number of high-profile boy boycotts that were... Um, carried out by the likes of Elton John and others boycotting hotels like the Dorchester. Um, great, um, but I wonder how much of an impact that has um, on the people of Brunei. Such as that quote again on the screen. The UK. I married my husband in 2016 in the first um, same-sex marriage in a Baptist church in, the, in Great Britain. Um, so part of the UK. I have to be very careful about which geographies I'm using there. Yeah, the first one in Great Britain. Um, I can walk down a street in London fairly confidently that any sign of intimacy with my husband might go okay. Probably I might get a look, but I probably am okay. But then recent coverage of the young lesbian couple that were attacked on a bus in central London suggests that that might not always be the case. But generally my life as an out gay man is not impacted by my sexuality. Um, so on the surface level, it looks like we've ticked all the boxes, doesn't it? Gays have got marriage, woohoo, we're done. And what that does is it erases the other identities. It erases, and I'm really glad that bisexuality is on the topic of discussion for today. Uh, it erases bisexuality and exploring what bisexuality looks like in the modern church and the modern society. It erases people who are trans and non-binary. It erases that, that actually we're not done. And if you look at the articles on the some certain tabloids, um, they, the rhetoric that is used around trans people in particular is almost word for word the same that was used for gay men in the sort of 70s and 80s. Um, you can put articles next to each other and it's like they just copied and pasted the article and just swapped gay for trans. Um, so we're not done. The UK is not safe for LGBTQ plus people. It's, a, it's mostly safe for me as a privileged white man, but it's not safe for LGBTQ plus people. Particularly when we're talking about issues of asylum um, and those seeking refuge. 
Uh, MCC North London recently produced a report, uh, the LGBT African Asylum Seeker Research Project report, that documents how problematic and how difficult it is for people who are seeking asylum and refuge from the African continent in the UK to prove that they are LGBTQ+, and that they have a real need to seek asylum. One of the, um, Joseph Willits is an is a activist and um, he's quite prolific on Twitter. This is horrendous. Home Office uses faith against LGBTQ asylum seekers using language of those who deny their existence. Shameful that questions like how can you be lesbian and Christian isn't the Bible being gay, um, isn't the Bible against being gay are asked of those seeking asylum. Um, so this kind of, uh, it didn't really pick as much news as I kind of thought it should have done. Um, this report was published by MCC North London, exploring, because MCC North London has a particular ministry and focus on those seeking asylum. Um, and it was produced documenting how the Home Office is, is allegedly, and with some proof, um, using Christianity as a tool against people seeking asylum. And it just, for me, it just smacks of colonialism again. It's like, okay, good, we've got a Bible, we've got, here's a Bible, we're just going to whack you around the head with it because you don't look like what we think you should look like. Does that not sound like colonialism to you? So we at One Body, One Face produced a statement, and the statement goes as thus. The Home Office wielding Christianity as a weapon against LGBT plus asylum seekers would be a farce if it weren't for the harm it is causing two or three times marginalised people. It is offensive to the message contained within scripture, lived out in the life of Christ, to dangerously misappropriate the Christian faith in this way. And the clear misuse of scripture, scripture to manipulate people smacks of colonialism. The report is readily available online, and I would, if you are passionate about this, I would readily suggest that you actually go and read that. Um, but what it shows is, is that actually this, this rhetoric of the UK being a safe haven just isn't true. And that people that desperately need to seek asylum and desperately need to find refuge in our, in, in our borders are being turned away because of their sexual or gender identity. So not only are they being asked in those invasive questions that I alluded to afterwards, in which they're being asked to show pictures, they're being asked to, uh, they're having uh, invasive exams, uh, physical exams to, to prove uh, homosexual activity. Um, but they're also now being told that their faith doesn't match up with uh, their lived sexual gender identity. Um, and as someone who is standing here telling you that it does, that to me seems problematic. So some scripture, why not, eh? What is our mandate as disciples of Christ? It's all very well and good talking about what's happening in the world. It's all very well and good discussing these issues. It, you know, it, most people would react in horror, even if you hold a conservative theology, would react in horror to people being killed because of their sexuality. But so what? Why as Christians is this particularly relevant for us? Uh, there's a passage um, in the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures from Second Kings um, that looks um, that documents the story of a woman who her children are about to be sold into slavery to pay off her debts, and she goes to Elisha to ask for help. Uh, she doesn't know what to do, and she's at her wit's end. Um, and Elisha instructs her to use the little oil that she has and go around and ask her neighbours to um, for some empty storage jars um, and to then use that tiny oil to fill up all of those jars. Um, so this is um, from part of that passage. So she left him and shut the door behind her and her children. They kept bringing vessels to her and she kept pouring. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. But he said to her, there are no more. Then the oil stopped flowing. In a society of plenty, whether you have plenty yourself or not, it can seem that we can remove God from the equation. So advertising sells, um, and it sells us everything that we do and everything that we don't need. Um, when the world provides everything, why do we need to then turn to God? We're raised to inhabit a world that demands that we take and we take and we take from the environment, from the, those who are impoverished and create the clothes that we're wearing, from those who need state services when we don't pay our fair share of tax. The list goes on and on because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? And then, then we look at people coming to our country who are in need and seeking that need. 
But when our needs are met by next day delivery, year round vegetables and fruit that aren't grown according to traditional seasonal patterns and an economic model that favors the rich over the poor and favors people that look like me, is it any wonder that we forget what it's like to value a gift and then want to give back something of value equal or more? We are conditioned to expect more and more without having to give anything extra. And that causes conflict when we read passages like this and maybe reflect and meditate on um, the passage from Second Kings later. Um, but it causes great conflict when we see such scarcity. Uh, that single jar of olive oil becomes many. The widow visits her neighbours and seeks out many empty jars. She participates in this act willingly so that when she comes out to pour out her oil as instructed, it keeps flowing and all of the jars are filled. God transforms scarcity and abundance through the faithfulness of that widow. As Spurgeon notes, and I, again, good Baptist, quoting Spurgeon, if she borrowed few vessels, she would have little oil. If she borrowed many vessels, they should all be filled and she should have much oil. At the end of the story, she goes on to sell that oil and her, and her debts, and therefore she's released from her debts. And this is again in, echoed in the Gospel of John with a miraculous turning of water into wine. That's Jesus' first public miracle, an example of abundance in the face of scarcity, and not just abundance of necessities, but the life-enriching fun stuff, if you like it, like wine. And again, later in the Gospel of John, when Jesus takes a small amount of bread and fish offered as a gift and invites his disciples to share it amongst those gathered, Philip is sure there won't be enough, and I empathise with Philip because I like logistics and details, and I want to know, you know I've got a spreadsheet tracking everything, but he's sure there isn't enough because he's rooted in those logistics and careful planning. Even in his wildest dreams and plans, he could only just fathom just enough for everyone, only the smallest amount. But Jesus takes that scarcity, that desire for only just enough, and brings about abundance. Of course, the supernatural element here could be explained away. That inspired the young boy, by the young boy, everyone brought out what they had and shared it amongst themselves. But given the context of scarcity, isn't that a miracle in itself? Giving when that's all you have. That's our mandate. That. What I just read. Whatever our political position on the current status quo, however we feel about the other or our neighbour, our mandate as followers of Christ is that through scarcity, God gives abundance. But we have to be participants in that. If we sit back and just say, oh, someone else will do it, MCC North London will do it, it won't happen. With Elisha and the widow, the widow was an active participant in God's miracle. With the feeding of the 5,000, the young boy and the disciples and those receiving were all active participants of that miracle. It wasn't just a case of Jesus waving his magic wand and everything being fixed. All of us in this room need to be active participants in the miracle of seeing a world that looks a bit like the kingdom of heaven, that looks a little bit like the other being welcomed, that looks a little bit like the home office, not scaring LGBTQ plus refugee and asylum seekers, that looks like churches opening their doors, not just to the straight passing occasionally, gay men that walk in, those that tick the nice little boxes, those that can conform because it's married, he's okay, he's allowed in. But the wonderful diversity and queerness that, is, that fills the land, that's our mandate. Through scarcity, there is abundance in God. That's me. You can email me, you can tweet me, um, do chat to me afterwards as well. I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you.